Hey, this is Craig Kidd of the Greg Kidd Band, and you're listening to Backstage Access, where the real show begins. Welcome to the show, everybody. We're here with artist Greg Kinn. You may remember Kinn as one of the acts who helped put MTV on the map back in the early 80s with such videos as A Breakup Song and Jeopardy. The band also played American Bandstand and opened up for the Rolling Stones. Today, Kinn is supporting his latest effort, Rekindled. Welcome to Backstage Access, Greg. Hey, thanks for having me on, and uh, it's great to be on with you. I want to talk to you about the early success of the Greg Kinn Band. How was it being the MTV Darlings way back when video started taking off? Oh, it was great. You know, we, we were basically a bar band until around that time. You know, that was uh, our first uh, successful uh, MTV video was, uh, was um, Jeopardy. And that was 1983. When we had the breakup song in 81, they didn't even have videos yet. Right. In fact, I think there was a live video of us, and that was all there was. But, right. you know, when we had uh, the, the Jeopardy video, got tons and tons of airplay because it was the, one of the first concept videos. You know, it actually told a story. It was a mini movie. Right. And I remember because you know, they were asking me, what, you know, what do you want to do? And they asked me what, what I liked. And I said, I, I like horror movies. I like, you know, zombie movies. So let's do a Night of the Living Dead thing. So one thing led to another. We cut that. And MTV jumped right on that. And we got into heavy rotation simply because it was one of the few concept videos. Um, and then, you know, the beauty, the beautiful thing was, six months later, here comes Weird Al, and he's got the parody of it. Yeah. And he had a big hit, uh, hit video on MTV, I Lost on Jeopardy, right. which, I, which he invited me down to LA, and I came down for the day, and I made a cameo appearance in the video, and that was pretty, and I got to meet Don Pardo. That was the highlight of the whole thing. Plus, I gotta tell you, man, Weird Al is like one of the nicest, funniest guys you will ever meet. And it was just hang, hanging with him for a whole day it was just a hoot. Well, basically, if Weird Al does a parody of you, you know you made it. Yeah, you know, that's what everybody <laughs> tells me. And, I, you know, I feel like, uh, you know, I kind of. I was flattered, like, you know, he's got a call, when, when he does a parody, he has to have permission right, correct. of the original songwriter yep. to, to do that, so, you know, he called me up and I said, hey man, not only I'm flattered that you would choose my thing, and he said, well, I got a really great idea for the song called I Lost on Jeopardy, you know, with the Jeopardy, uh, you know, the Jeopardy TV show. And I thought, man, that is a great idea. So, and plus, I, you know, as I said before, he's such a um, a nice guy, a magnanimous guy. Now, that was how many years ago? It was 1983. 83. Yep. 83. Yep. I still, to this day, I still get mailbox money from Weird Al. <laughs> Can you believe that? And it's because... It was that he put that on a, 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 one of his greatest hits album. I think he just came out with a box set, actually. Yeah, like platinum or something. Yep. A box set shaped as the accordion, so, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so it was really, uh, I was really flattered. And, you know, it, it was great being the darlings of MTV. I was doing guest DJ work and hanging out. And every time I went to New York, it seemed like... Uh, you know, there was something new going on. And uh, it was the birth of, you know, it was the birth of videos. Right, really. yep. Uh, and we felt like we were on the cutting edge because like we were one of the first concept videos. Plus I gotta tell you, it was a lot of fun to make it because we were making, basically we were making a low budget horror movie, which, you know, what could be more fun than that? 
Now, actually getting on 1983 in that video, I know that came out before Michael Jackson's Thriller. You think he got any ideas from yours? Oh, absolutely. I'm sure that he did. Uh, there was really, I can't think of one other video at, at that time, at the time of Jeopardy, that was, that was anything like it. Right. Um, I remember a lot of, you know, fake live stuff and, you know, guys singing in alleyways and stuff, but I know, I don't remember seeing any concept videos, which, you know, I gotta say, it, it was wonderful and it catapulted the band from just, you know, being a bar band and working all the, you know, working all the bars across the country. Uh, suddenly we were dressed into this new world and we were playing much bigger venues and we were opening for Journey and we were touring all over the world and it was a really exciting time. And then opening up for the Rolling Stones. Tell us about that. Oh, well, hey, listen, man. I, 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 8,000 <laughs> people. Right. Now, I don't get nervous, man. I just don't. I haven't gotten nervous since 19... <laughs> I haven't gotten nervous. I, I mean, I, last time I got nervous was I was 16 playing at a hootenanny and there was a girl I liked. <laughs> but I don't remember ever being ner nervous. You know, over the years, you just you get immune to that because you're a musician and, you know, you got your gig and you just go out there and do it. And you, you never think about, oh, my God, but what if I make a mistake? Because I, I just enjoy playing. Uh, I enjoy playing, performing live, and you know it's uh, it's a kick for me. So uh, I never got nervous, but that one time I walked out in front of eighty thousand people. Now that was overwhelming. It was it was at the Kingdom, which has since been uh, right Seattle, correct? Down, yeah, in yep. Seattle. And uh, we opened a couple of shows for the Stones, and my God, it was unbelievable. And you know, the thing was, that was a Bill Graham show. Okay. And um, Prince had been the opener. It was, uh, it was uh, Prince, Jay Giles, and the Stones. And then Prince took his pants off and pranced around the, the stage in at the Forum in L.A. the first two nights. Uh, yeah, and got booed. So he got fired, got fired yep. right there on the spot. They said, you know, hey, look, there's only one sex symbol on this tour, and it's not you. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. I guess Mick Jagger didn't, you know, he, he thought it was a bit much. <laughs> anyway, he, he, he gets fired, and that afternoon, like the day before, Bill Graham calls me up out of the clear blue sky. He goes, hey, would you be available to open from the Stones tomorrow night? And I said, oh, what kind of a question is that? Of course I'm available. <laughs> yeah, you know, the Stones, I cancel anything. So you took, you guys took Prince's spot. Now, I knew Prince got uh, fired from that uh, after the first couple of shows, but I had no idea you took his Prince spot. Gotcha. And with the, the people that took our slot was uh, was um, George Thorogood. Okay. And George you know, found, you know, did the rest of the tour. But at the time, it was, you know, I mean, we were, uh, you know, we were riding high. It was, uh, you know, we had some big success on the radio. And I think, and so after the gig, I go look at my, my mother. God bless her. She's in heaven now. But my mother used to say, always go and you have, always thank that nice Bill Graham for whatever it gets you a gig. That's motherly advice. So every time I played, and I played for Bill maybe once a month there for a couple of years. I mean, we were playing everywhere. We were like America's opening band. Right. And every time I would find Bill, I go, thanks for the gig, Bill. And he'd go, yeah, you did a good job or whatever. So I'm looking for Bill, and he, I say, hey, thanks for the gig, uh, Bill. And he says, come with me, come with me. And he says, shut up and come with me. So I, I just followed him. He took me through 17 layers of security into the inner sanctum of the stones. And there I was in the stones dressing room, sitting on a couch with Jerry Hall, 
at Mick Jagger, right across from Charlie Watts, and it was unbelievable. And I, you know, I mean, these guys are, you know, my, right. my, my heroes, childhood idols. So uh, and I had a real nice conversation about how we tried to not, uh, you know, Charlie Watts was, was saying, you, you, the thing is you've got to play it like it's a little club. Don't be put off that it's a stadium with 18,000 people. Play like there's 80 people when you're in a little club. Well, that's easy for you to say. I was so pumped up with the trail and it put 80 count of people, my God. Mm. In fact, I cut the shit our head short because I wanted the stones to come home. <laughs> well, let's fast forward a little bit now. You know, I grew up in the MTV generation and and growing up, I'm, I'm very familiar with all the bands that were on MTV at the beginning, especially your band. And then after a while, it's, it seems like, you know, tastes change, things change, obviously musical uh, tastes and, and whatever change. And it, it seems like, you know, and, f and for me, you might have, obviously you've been recording since that time, but people, a lot of people will be like, well, where did Greg King go? But, you know, yeah. you just came out with a new record, Rekindled, and like I said, you've been re pretty much recording steadily since 1983. So tell us, let's just jump right into the new record and tell us about Rekindled. Well, first of all, the first part of your question was, where was Greg Kidd for the last 18 years? And the answer was, I was doing the morning show on K Fox Radio in San Francisco. That's correct. I had to get up at 4, I to get up at 4 a.m. and it was killing me. And I did that for 18 freaking years. I was going to ask you about that later, actually, and ask you why would you give it up? Well, you know, that's, that's why I didn't tour any time. Okay. You know, I was too good. I mean, you know, we had like maybe a handful of gigs every summer, and that was it. But, um, I, you know, the fact that, uh, that the band endures, you know, like we're a heritage band. Now, granted, of the five guys that cut the breakup song, only two guys are left standing. Uh, that's me and uh, Larry Lynch, the drummer, who always drank milk and went to bed early and didn't take drugs. <laughs> Everybody else is dead, except for me. And you know, like if you could come up to me and say, look, I don't hate eyes, or you'd be the, one, the first one to drop. Because I was doing blow and, you know, drinking Jack Daniels like it was going out of style. And, and uh, smoking fatties every day. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I was like, you know, I was on the highway to hell. But you know, come on, we were, we were getting, you know, we, we, we were realizing the dream. You know, our, we were in a band that you, we were a hit, and it was just party time all the time. Well, as obviously as the years went by, uh, you get older, wiser, and you know, quit doing all that crazy stuff. But now I go back into the studio and really and rekindle is a good is a good title because it's like rekindling my career. Right. Um, first of all, I got a great band this time. Really, this is the best great kid band ever. Uh, I got my son Rye. I was going to talk to you about that. Yeah. Now, man, that boy, he he can flat out play. And he graduated a jazz guitar major from Cal Arts in L.A., so he's, he, you know, he, he, he was in uh, Berkeley School of Music, and he was a former student of Joe Satriani when Joe was in the band. There you go. A lot of people didn't, didn't know that Joe had, you know, did uh, guitar lessons to, to a select few people, and uh, he taught Rye, Rye, you know, everything he knew. And that was before he went to college and learned how to do it. So that's playing with my son is a new dimension. I love it. Uh, the, you know, he and I think the same. He grew up watching the Greg Kid Band. He knows all the songs and all the new songs. He, you know, it, it, it's you know he he's just he's it's extra special to have your son doing it. And now we got uh, a new drummer, Dave Lauser who is, um, comes to us from the Sammy Hagar band, and he is just unbelievable. Goes out there, he's like Keith Moon, man. He's, <laughs> he's like all fills and really flashy and really exciting, and he hits those 
drums really hard. Mm -hmm. And then we got uh, the Robert Barry on bass. Uh, Robert's got some pretty big shoes to fill with, you know, Steve Wright, the late yep. Steve Wright. Yep. And, uh, you know, and I love Steve, we were brothers, but, you know, uh, I've been working now with Robert for uh, a bunch of years. And, you know, it's gotten to the point where we can now think alike. And, you know, he, he owns a studio, a sound tech studio here in California. So we just, every, every Wednesday, we go over there and hang out all day and kick around song ideas. And we already got three songs into the next album. Wow. Can you believe that? So wow. having your having the bass player also be the producer of the band and the owner of the studio really helps because yep. you know, now you're basically going into the studio and just part around it. If you do something that you know, it's not like you're on the clock. If you come up with something great then you can record it and stop what you're doing. But if you don't, you don't you know, you don't have to do anything. So doing that, I mean, it's, it was liberating. And tell us about... The first song, I remember the first song that we recorded was uh, Big Pink Flamingo. And that's what I was just going to ask you about, Pink Flamingo, and tell us about the video for Pink Flamingo, too. Uh, that, was a, that was a hoot. Yeah, I really enjoyed that. Uh, that's one of my favorite songs. And ironically, it's the first song that we recorded and we wrote for the new album, Rekindled. So, uh, Rye came in to the studio and he had this riff, this guitar riff, which, which, which would later become Big Flamingos. And he just started playing the riff and I just started out of the clear blue sky, started singing, singing uh, Big, Big Flamingos. I don't know where it came from. It just, it just popped into my mind. And I grabbed my notebook, oh, so I always have my notebook with me. And we started whacking out some uh, lyrics. And once, once I figured out what the song was about, uh, about this trailer trash, you know, uh, queen, you know, the kind of chick, he, 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 I don't know if you've ever seen a trailer trash queen. But, you know, <laughs> they got the stretch pants on. Yep. They chew it with chew the gum. They got yep. hair up in curlers. And, you know, and once I visualized the chick, it was so easy to write the song because all I was doing was just describing her and all the things she did. And uh, that was and that was kind of tongue, tongue in cheek. You know, we were just having fun with that. And it's kind of set the pace for the whole album. You know, we, we just had fun with it. Um, you know, there were some of the songs that were, like for instance, uh, Cassandra, which is also one of my favorite songs on the album. I wrote that song on the way to the studio. It's about 45 minutes drive to the studio from my house. So I'm on the freeway. I'll just, you know, my mind is wandering and I start coming up with this song. And I wrote, I wrote the whole song in my mind. You know, I knew what, the, I knew what it was gonna sound like and I knew what the, song, the chords were going to be, and I just wrote this really, it just, I don't know what happened, I just, it just was a spontaneous thing, and I wrote it in the, in my mind, in the, in the car, so as soon as I walked into the studio, I said, I just, I got to demo the song right now, because I just wrote it, so I, I got the, you know, I, I whipped out the electric guitar, and that's why it's so primitive sounding, because it's me on the electric. And, uh, it, you know, we did it real quick, and I, I showed the guys, and they were like, hey, that's great, man, let's do this, let's do that. We, we, we put together the arrangement and recorded it the same day. And that's the freshness that I'm talking about with Rekindle. You know, I've never really, I mean, it's been a long time since I was able to do that. Now, I wanted to talk about um, another song on there, Brain Police One. I thought that was a very interesting title. Wanted to see how you came up with that track. You know, uh, it's interesting. I, I came up with that track, and I remember uh, coming in, uh, I came up with a chorus first, and I came into the studio, 
and I just laid down the chorus just to, before I would forget it. And then I was listening to the chorus driving home that day. And by the time I got home, I had the, the whole thing written in my head. So I pulled into my driveway and whipped out the notebook and put down basically uh, the whole song, right? And it, and it was amazing. I don't know how that happened. I can tell you that it's a creative spark and it's a juice. You either have it or you don't. You know, I didn't write a song for over a year mm. when I was doing the radio thing because I just wasn't thinking like that. Right. But since I've been working back in the studio again, I, I find it the most fun around. And it's, you know, it's, it's just, uh, I think I, of all the things I do, that's one of my all-time favorite things, kicking around song ideas with my guys in the studio, and then we, you know, spontaneously just coming up with something on the spot. You know, and a lot of those songs, uh, Brain Police was like that too. And you know, I went back and found Larry Lynch, the original drummer for the Great Ken Band, for many, many years and had uh, Larry come in and be the guest drummer on that. Okay. And he just nailed it. He just came in and just nailed it in one take, man. And he had, you know, because Larry always had this different approach to the drums. If you listen to the breakup song or Jeopardy, you know, he was not, he was more like a Ringo kind of a guy, you know? He wasn't a fancy guy, but he was, he was locked into the groove. Right. And, I, I, and bringing him on uh, the brain police, it, that's when the whole song really just came together. And I was really proud of that one. You know, I, there's a couple of songs on the album that, are, that you could consider some, somewhat top, top, um, uh, topographical, you know what I mean? Topic, what am I saying? Topical. Topicals of topographical. <laughs> I sound like FM radio there. No, you know, uh, stuff that just, you know, tell me something good is another one. It was, you know, just kind of uh, me reacting to, you know, the news and what you, what you see on TV and read the paper. And, you know, I've never done that before, but this time I, I just kind of, you know, it just it felt right. In fact, everything on the album felt right. That's that's the wonderful thing about Rekindle. Um, as I said before, I don't remember from the last time that I felt like this, and it's been. And as I said before, we're already working on the next one, so this band is primed. And if you ever get a chance to see us, if we're playing in your town, you got to see the band live because there is no. There's no substitute for live. Yep. You got to see it live. And, and the you, if you hear, for instance, Pink, Pink, Pink Flamingos live, it's, you know, it sounds like the end of the world, man. <laughs> yeah, and I'm going to actually get into your gigging, and your guys are playing Canal Side in Buffalo on July 29th, which is the second annual Reb Fest. Have you ever played the Buffalo area before? Oh, yeah, a, a bunch of times. And uh, uh, where we... Played there with Journey. Okay. Uh, in, in the big, big arena, whatever. Yep. That was. It was Memorial Auditorium, but it's yeah. no longer there. I, I had, yeah, I think I played there like maybe half a dozen times over the years. Any good memories of Buffalo? We just had a great time. It was, you know, we got, we got good solid airplay um, yeah. in Buffalo, and they've always supported the great kid band. I've always had a, a, a small spot for Buffalo. Well, we're uh, going to be excited to see you, and I'm actually going to ask you one last question before I let you go. That also, you're an author, and you author. I think you is it 14 books you have out now. I could be wrong. Uh, no, it's uh, let me see, four, six, seven, seven. Seven uh, books. Okay, I thought it was. I'm working on the uh, next one right now. About halfway through it. Okay. And I got another one in the can, which I'm waiting another year before I publish. But uh, the the one I'm working on now is this. It's the uh, sequel to the last two. It's a trilogy. Rubber Soul was the first one. Okay. 
Painted, Painted Black was the second one. And the third one is Anarchy in the UK. And that's going to be uh, probably in the springtime. I'm about 200 pages into it. But you know, here's the thing. You, you start writing these things and you go off on a tangent, you know, you might write 50 pages, you know, and you might bring a whole new character in and you don't know. You say, well, this, uh, I'll be done by the fall, but you never know because, you know, <laughs> You're, you're, you're kind of you're letting the story write itself, and uh, I, I just really I've always been a writer. When I was a kid, you know, I remember in elementary school I used to write stories and illustrate them and everything. And then uh, later on, I had an electric typewriter, once I, which I won in a, ta- a talent contest on the local uh, top forty station. Mm. <laughs> And uh, I started banging out stories. Jeez, that was in uh, that was in high school. So I've always really been a writer. It's only been uh, since about ninety five, ninety six that I've been a professional writer. Uh, with, you know, published. Uh, and it's really great to have somebody out there publishing your books because you know they write me every once in a while and they tell me how good things are going. So that's it's a great it's a great feeling. And I, I just do this because it's fun. I don't really, you know, I, I love to read and I love to write. And if I'm not writing a song, well, I'll probably write the novel. Well, we thank you. I know, uh, you know, you probably have a lot going on and we appreciate you taking the time to talk to us at Backstage Access with the new record. Congratulations on Rekindled and good luck with the book release when it comes out for Anarchy in the UK next year and also like I said we're going to be looking forward to seeing your gig at Canal Side in Buffalo on July 29th. Yeah we're really looking forward to that one and uh, I got to tell you that the band is as tight as tight can be. Uh, we'll be doing all of our hits, obviously, and uh, some select older tunes from the album, some, you know, favorites, and uh, a handful of new ones, so you get a really nice balanced show of all kinds of stuff. Sounds great. Uh, thank you so much again. I once knew a girl, but well, she was fine and dandy. She was.